the National Broadcasting Company and the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education present Continental Classroom, a course in physics for the atomic age, conducted by Dr. Harvey E. White of the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. White's guest today is Dr. Charles S. Draper, head of the Aeronautical Engineering Department at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This program has been made possible through the cooperation of Bell Telephone System, the Ford Foundation, the Fund for the Advancement of Education, General Foods Fund, International Business Machines, Pittsburgh Plate Glass Foundation, the California Oil Company, United States Steel. Dr. White. Today's lesson, number 80, on the subject of inertial guidance, is the last lesson of the first semester. We're happy to have as our guest for this lesson, Dr. Charles S. Draper. Dr. Draper obtained his AB degree at Stanford University in 1922, his BS degree in 1926, his MS degree in 1928, and his Doctor of Science degree in physics in 1938 all at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. For his various contributions, he received the 1946, in 1946, the Medal for Merit, a presidential citation, and later the Engineering Society of New England Award, the Naval Ordnance Development Award, the Exceptional Civilian Service Award of the U.S. Air Force, and another such award from the Navy and many others. His most recent awards are the Navy Distinguished Public Service Award for the development of a long-range submerged navigation system, the 1958 Holly Medal of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the 1958 Blandy Medal of the American Ordnance Association, and was made an Honorary American Fellow of the Institute of Aeronautical Sciences in 1959. Dr. Draper has developed anti-aircraft fire control equipment for the Navy and airborne fire control equipment for the Air Force. He has also developed inertial guidance equipment for both these services. He is head of the Aeronautical Department, Engineering Department, and the Director of Instrumentation Laboratory of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Welcome, Dr. Draper, to Continental Classroom. Thank you, Dr. White. The subject for today is guidance. It's inertial guidance in particular, but before we get into the particular end of the game, I would like to define the subject before us. Guidance is associated with the control of a vehicle, a guided vehicle, which we wish to have a certain desired path. And the desired path is very seldom achieved we actually have some real path which differs from the desired path by a path correction. This is the amount we'd have to change the real path in order to make it coincident with the desired path. We do this by changing the vehicle motion. This is a general proposition, whether we're down under the ocean or out in the far reaches of space. Now, guidance is a process of one finding the path correction. In other words, how far are we away from the place we should be? And second, using vehicle motion control based on guidance commands from the path correction to make the actual path as close as possible to the desired path. Now, usually, finding the path correction is difficult. The vehicle motion correction is easier. Our subject today is the phase of guidance as concerned with finding the path correction. We do this not because we don't recognize that the other part of the game is important, but merely because we know that finding the path correction is the thing that we must do if this is a hard thing. Now, let's look at the beginnings of uh, guidance. Uh, guidance has been with us uh, since the time when the human race uh, crawled out of the seas and became, in fact, uh, uh, land dwellers. Uh, this little card here is intended to il illustrate a gentleman in a dugout canoe who's going home. His guidance 
consists in looking over to where he wants to go. This is his desired path. And then making his arms go in such a fashion that the dugout canoe goes to the place he wishes to be. Now this is radiation contact. The radiation happens to be light, but this is all right. We do this over and over again. Now to come to a somewhat more sophisticated situation, which is the radio guidance of aircraft, <coughs> very common today, although not perfect, as we all know, who have ground around over LaGuardia Field for many hours, uh, we have radio stations on the ground. This is the Earth. We know where these stations are on the Earth. We can then, by equipment in the airplane, we can determine where these two stations are uh, with respect to the airplane, and so we can determine where we are in the aircraft, and knowing that, we can then change the aircraft's course to make it go in the right direction. Now, <coughs> also a common method of guidance that we have with us today is, is radar guidance. We do this at airports. We all know about the ground approach control. But in particular, if we have a guided missile here, we have some kind of a transmitter for radar impulses here. We have a radar receiver here. We know where these are on the ground. This radiation contact here makes it possible for us to follow the missile in such a way that we can determine where it is and we can make it do what we want it to do in order to go over and accomplish its mission. Now, this is another type of guidance, but please notice that, again, this is radiation contact because we must have radiation between points on the ground and the thing we wish to guide. Now, <clears throat> a much older form of guidance than that is celestial navigation. Here we have a ship, and the ship has a navigator. Uh, the navigator looks through the optical system of a sextant out to some star. He compares the line of sight to the star from here to here with a plane established by looking at the horizon, and he measures this angle, the elevation of the line of sight to the star, or which is equivalent to measuring the angle of the line of sight to the star from the local vertical. Having done that, <coughs> he has the information that he can use for finding where the ship is with respect to where the ship should be. This is celestial navigation. And this, again, is radiation contact because the man who looks at the star must have a radiation contact with the star. The coordinate system, the, the, the space in which he uh, does his thinking, however, is the celestial sphere. This is the thing that's established by the fixed stars. And now, <coughs> actually, if the people on the ground, as they do in peacetime, wish to cooperate with the people on the ship, we can also expect to have stations out here, radio stations, that enable the people on the ship to determine where they are. Now, the essential point in, in the celestial navigation uh, approach is that we must have some means of establishing the local vertical, that is, the direction of gravity at the point where the ship may be at the time it wishes to find out where it is. Uh, these local verticals, which actually are established by uh, nothing more complicated, uh, here in the room, that is, uh, than a pendulum, which is a, a string and a weight down here. If we establish this local vertical, we then can associate each local vertical direction with a point on the Earth's surface. Now, this is uh, a very old matter. And we can see what we're trying to do. Uh, here we have same, some point. I'm actually picking out Chicago. I don't know why. But there's Chicago. And here is, uh, well, uh, these are the Hawaiian Islands over here. Now, the difference between these two positions, as far as we're concerned for this game, is that the direction of this vertical is different from the direction of this vertical, measured on the Earth. We also can measure the difference between these two things with respect to the stars in the celestial sphere. And if we have that information, we know how the Earth is rotating, we can then find ourselves in such a way that we can actually uh, 
do what's necessary in order to correct our path to go anywhere we desire to go. This is the essential point in this celestial navigation. Now, <coughs> uh, if we look at the real problem as it exists for us today, we're in a submarine, <coughs> and for obvious reasons, if, if we're in a submarine for earnest, that is for real, uh, we do not wish to have people on the surface know where we are. So that means that we stay under the surface as much as we can. We don't poke up any radio antennas. We don't come out with, with uh, anything to look around. We would like to be able to do guidance of the submarine under the surface of the water, way down under the surface of the water. And we don't want to come up every now and then to look around. Now, the way that this can be done is to set up in the submarine uh, something we can call an inertial reference uh, space package. This is actually a piece of equipment down inside the submarine that holds its direction with respect to the fixed stars. In other words, to the stars that we use to establish the celestial sphere. And if we have that information in the submarine and it holds well enough for us to do the job, we can do anything we care to down under the water as far as determining where we are, how fast we're going, and all the rest of it in such a fashion that we can do what we call inertial guidance under the water. Now, uh, to do this kind of thing, <coughs> you merely require something of which this might be a model. We can put something inside of this sphere uh, that will indeed hold its position among the stars. And if it holds that position well enough, we can then do inertial navigation. We don't need to come up. We can stay under literally for days. And we know that this is not entirely a figment of my imagination because we've recently read articles in uh, Saturday Evening Post and other journals which say, in effect, that the Nautilus did go under the polar ice cap and did know pretty well where it was all the time. I'm not allowed to make statements as to how accurate this was, but the fact remains that uh, this was very helpful in doing a job that man might not have been bold enough to do otherwise. Now, <coughs> this matter of inertial guidance involves certain principles. These principles are very simple. They're not new. They're very old. And the only thing that has occurred in these recent years and actually, this whole subject has developed since 1945, uh, is that mankind have learned to do things more accurately and have learned to use techniques, electronic techniques, transistors have helped, metals have helped, all kinds of modern physics, solid state physics have helped. But these things have combined to permit us to make equipment which is indeed much more accurate than we had before. But the principles are the principles laid out by Newton many years ago. Now, <coughs> there are two problems that we have seen. One is the problem, if you're going to navigate over the Earth, of determining the direction of the local vertical. In other words, the direction in which a plumb bob would hang if it were on a stationary base. This is uh, very rudimentary. It's what's been done for years. The other one is establishing a space that will stay non-rotating with respect to the stars, the celestial sphere, and yet we want this to be a kind of equipment that we can carry with us, literally in a suitcase, uh, so that we can tell, although we can't see the stars, we can tell where the stars actually are. Now, the uh, whole matter depends on Newton's law of motion. And Newton's law of motion uh, is very simple, really. We have a mass. <coughs> we apply a force to this mass. There will be an acceleration. That is, the thing will be speeded up in the direction of the force. In order for this force to exist, we must have, because of Newton's law of action and reaction, we must have an equal and opposite force going this way. This is the inertia reaction force. And we all know this exists because we, if we take a weight on a string, 
we know we can jerk the string and the weight will pull back at us. Now, we're interested by means of this law in doing several things. But the first of these things is to measure the acceleration. That is, how fast the thing speeds up. Because with respect to inertial space, this is the only thing we can really measure. Now, if we take a spring and hook it onto the mass, and then we accelerate, speed up the, this end of the spring, the mass pulls backward with an inertia reaction force which is proportional to the acceleration of the mass in this direction. When we start, the spring is not stretched. When we reach some kind of an equilibrium, the spring, indeed, if we continue to accelerate this way, the spring is stretched by the inertia reaction force in such a way that this stretch of the spring here is a measure of the acceleration. Now, this gives us a means for determining, with respect to inertial space, how fast this thing is speeded up, accelerated. Now, if our problem were a problem confined to a, a, a nice level plane, nice uh, plane like this table here, uh, we would indeed have a very simple problem. We could do the whole job by making an accelerometer which consists of a mass on some kind of a base connected with the spring so that this mass will slide backwards on the base if we accelerate this thing in this direction and we can measure this displacement here of this mass and use the indication of that to, in the first place, to sum up the indications, that is, the stretch of the spring, which depend on acceleration, we would get the velocity. This is the first integral, as they say. Then if we take the integral of this velocity, we'll come out with the distance. In other words, the distance this thing has moved. This is beautiful. I, I will give you a little demonstration here of the elements that go into one of these things. Here is a little structure. It carries a mass, has a rod, some springs, has down here an index that shows how far the mass has lagged behind. Now, this is not a very long table, but if I accelerate this thing in this direction, the first thing that will happen is that the inertia reaction will cause the mass to lag behind against the springs. And then when I stop the thing over on this side, the mass will try to keep going. It'll go in the other direction against the base. And this is the essential element of the so-called accelerometer. Now I'll do this over and back and over and back. Now, <coughs> Here, we have something that looks very attractive to doing the job. In practice, uh, we get in trouble. The reason we get in trouble is because we're not on a nice level plane. We're on a spherical surface around the center of the Earth. And the center of the Earth acts as a point of attraction for all masses that are out here. We know this. We can sit in chairs and we can observe this. So that if we make a pendulum, such as this. And the pendulum is standing still. It hangs down towards the center of the earth. That, that, that's this thing here. Now, the pendulum is not something that responds alone to gravity. It also responds to acceleration. No magic about this. If I take this thing here and I accelerate it, you see the pendulum lags behind. It also oscillates. This is one of the minor troubles we have to deal with. Uh, so that we cannot use a simple pendulum on a, on a vehicle that's being moved, accelerated, as a means for determining the vertical. We have to use a trick, and this trick is called Schuller tuning, and we make the system, and actually this is a long story. I, I'm sorry I can't go into it here. It involves servo mechanisms, electronic systems, and various things, but we can make this platform on which this thing stands so change its orientation, so tip itself, so that the linear acceleration divided by the radius of the Earth gives the angular acceleration of this thing. And that gives us the thing we call Schiller tuning, and that means that we can, in fact, 
trick. We don't trick Einstein. We merely use a, uh, a means for getting around his equivalence of mass and acceleration effects uh, on a spherical Earth. But that means that we can indeed get in a moving vehicle a very accurate indication of the vertical. This is done all the time. That gives us the direction of gravity. The thing we must now do is to get something that corresponds to the stars. And that correspondence to the stars is like setting up within our equipment a set of coordinates, a, 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 a space which stands still with respect uh, to way out yonder, to inertial space. <coughs> In order to do this, we have recourse to another uh, trick that comes out of Newton's laws of motion, and that is the thing that we call a gyroscope. Now, the gyroscope is nothing but a wheel, a spinning wheel, mounted in gimbals so that it, it can turn. It has degrees of freedom with respect to the base. Here I have a so-called two degrees of freedom gyro. By this I mean that the gyro can tip about this axis. It also can turn about that axis. Now, uh, as soon as you begin to spin a wheel, you get effects that are perfectly normal and natural. You don't have to do anything magic to explain them, but they look very peculiar if you're not uh, really uh, viewing the matter from the right point. Now, <coughs> have a wheel. If we push on push backwards on this end of the thing, push forward on that side of the thing over here. This is supposed to be like this model here. The wheel is turning this way. Up in this place, a pushing backwards will, will try to shove the wheel backwards at this point. It will shove the wheel forwards over here so that this motion that we give to the wheel at this point will come around here and here and will end up by causing the wheel to tip. Now, that is a very brief statement of, uh, of the principle of the gyro, uh, which you can read all about in books, uh, oh, two or three inches thick. Now, this means that if I push backwards here and I push uh, forwards there, that this device should indeed tip down like that. And you can see that it does. This is known as precession and is a very remarkable property. For inertial guidance, we're not particularly concerned with this property because of the fact that we don't care which way it turns. We only want the thing to hold still with respect to inertial space. And in practice, <coughs> we do something that's equivalent to this. Actually, in fact, we don't do exactly this, but the, the real detail of the mechanism uh, too complicated for me to go into here. You have two gyros. And these two gyros prevent a, a, a sphere here from moving about this axis or about the other axis or about this axis. So indeed, it, it is a thing equivalent to this. Now, I have my gyros inside this thing. And uh, to put it in the position I have over there, the gyros would be inside of this sphere. I could turn this sphere this way. <coughs> and the gyros would be forced to turn. If I set them up so that they stand still, then this thing holds still, and whatever else happens, this whole structure moves around it. Now, if I want to take out the rotation of the Earth, I can put a, a motor up here between this shiny sphere and this gimbal in such a fashion that you rotate this gimbal with respect to the sphere at a rate proportional to the Earth's rate. That means that we can then uh, combine the, the thing that seeks the vertical and the thing that holds still with respect to inertial space in such a way that if we come over here to the Earth, and this is a rotating Earth now, we can set these gyros up so that the gyro, gyros hold the sphere stationary uh, and pointing along the Earth's axis of rotation. Now that means that if we had this fixed to the Earth, at this thing as it goes around would, would rotate backwards in such a fashion that it holds its direction and as it holds its direction the earth then 
would apparently move with respect to this sphere. Now that's the essence of inertial guidance. If we put a clock in here to take out the Earth's rotation, we do in fact get this member here to stand still with respect to a line on the Earth, a meridian on the Earth. Then if we measure the direction of gravity with respect to this as it changes, that gives us a means of measuring how far we've moved over the Earth's surface. This is the way that inertial guidance systems have been built for aircraft. We can also use this thing in such a fashion that we cause the gyros to tip with respect to inertial space so that they stay with gravity. And as they do that, we can use a computer to keep track of how far they have tipped, and by means of this, we can tell how far the thing has gone. Now, both of these methods have been used. Both are successful. We can use these things actually in submarines, in airplanes, and uh, anything at all that, that moves in a constant altitude. On the other hand, if we're going to talk about a ballistic missile, we set these gyros in a certain place. We put the accelerometers on, and as the ballistic missile moves up in the Earth, Earth's gravitational field, this thing stands still. We use the accelerometers to keep track of the accelerations, and that gives us guidance. The same principle can be used for satellites. We set the gyros in this fashion, and then as we move around the Earth, these gyros hold their position, and we can tell where we are as, as a satellite. We can also use this same principle in going to the moon, going to Mars, going anywhere else we want in space. And going anywhere else we want in space uh, would not be done entirely by the gyros, but will, in fact, certainly use gyros in the system. There'll be star trackers in the matter, and this will be a technique that's developed very much as we go along. Uh, I predict that inertial principles will be used in all the guidance systems of the future. The details will be changed, many improvements will occur, but the inertial principles will be always, always with us. And uh, I can't presume to predict what the future is going to hold, but I'm sure it's going to be different from anything we imagined. I'm sure it's also going to be much more extensive, and we're going to do many more tricks than anybody today imagines that we can do. And how we do this, I don't know, but the human race is certainly going to go out into the stars. I thank you very much. Our guest today was Dr. Charles S. Draper, head of the Department of Aeronautical Engineering.